It's Sunday morning, and I'm going to talk to you about something I was going to talk about Wednesday night. I wasn't feeling well and wasn't able to talk Wednesday night. I talked to you about the tithe last week. I'll finish that later. But I want you to understand what a demon is. There's no such thing as demons. It's just self. The Bible says demons are self. The word demon is not in the Bible. You got three words that people confuse. You've got devil. Each time you find devil, it will either be, uh, it will be diabolos, or it will be demonion, which is our word demon. This is very important to understand. I believe the whole nation is involved in daimonion. All of America is involved in it. It comes from the root dio, meaning to distribute fortunes. It has the basic same definition, fortunes, basic same definition as capitalism. Capitalism means to distribute the fortunes of the railroads and companies and factories to the private individual. That's what you'll get out of Webster's. This means to distribute fortunes. When you look under demons, in the introduction to demons, in uh, the Encyclopedia of Religion by Hastings, they will tell you that it means to apportion. To apportion means to meet or measure out the fortunes of the world to the individual. That's the problem. Demon is the opposite of a daily cross or self-denial. That's, demon means to fulfill self, and the United States government was founded by Thomas Jefferson on something they called E-U-D-A-I-M-O-N-I-S-M. Eudaimonism means a well or a good demon, a good demon. And you need to understand something. Demons in the first century came in good and bad demons. They said a good demon got you a job. A bad demon, a well demon, got you a job, made you well, uh, brought you into some money. And a bad demon broke your leg, got you fired, or whatever. And there were more emphasis put on the good demons in the first century. In fact, Augustus Caesar was called the good God or the good demon. You'll find that in some of my Jewish books. And he was called, that's why the young man that came to Jesus said, good master, uh, what good thing shall I do? If you called anyone good besides Caesar, that was a capital offense. He could have died for that if somebody had hurt him. Jesus, why do you call me good? If I'm good, I'm God. Now, so in the first century, they called all of their ancestors by the title of demon or daimonion. They called them demons and they deified them, deified them. To deify means to make into a deity. A deity was a god. So they just deified their ancestors into gods. And when you had all these gods, whether it was Hercules or Aphrodite or Jupiter, or the list goes on and on, all these were called daemonion. They were called gods, and they were said to follow you around and guard you against loss, they were called guardians. 
That's, that's what the world called them guardians. They watched after you, made sure you uh, got good fortune instead of bad fortune. And if you believe in demons, you're believing in superstition. It's just a, I, I was listening to the radio. I can't believe what I heard John MacArthur say. He said, I walked into a room one time and uh, this uh, girl was in there and she was having a fit and doing all kinds of crazy things. And he said, when I walked in, uh, it was the demons in her that said, get out of here. They recognize a man of God. John, I can't believe that you believe that. He hasn't been as many Pentecostal churches as I have. I was a gospel singer years ago, and I went from one Pentecostal church to the other, and I had no business being there, but I was trying to be somebody in gospel music, trying to get fame and fortune. Well, that's not what we're supposed to be doing. Now, when we're talking about casting out, cast out devils, every time you find that, that is the word ek, Ballo. That's the word cast out. Cast out devils or diabolos. Diabolos means to lead somebody away and to take them over into areas they don't belong in. Ek balo is the word cast out. Balo is our word ball. It means to throw. So next time you're out throwing the ball around, say, throw me the throw, because that's what it means. It means to throw out. And from We get our word exit from egg. It means to throw out. How are demons thrown out according to the Bible? I want to show you this morning how that cast out devils is casting out self. It's the very picture of the scapegoat in Leviticus, the 16th chapter. You're going to find over in Luke, the 11th chapter, what Jesus says. These two chapters are, this is the shadow over here. The shadow is the scapegoat. And the very image in the New Testament is self. And you find out how that's done if we'll turn over to that turn over to that eleventh chapter of Luke. In the eleventh chapter of Luke, starting in the nineteenth verse, this is the chapter you're gonna find chapters in the Bible that are similar. So whenever you're in Luke 11, you got to look back at Matthew 12. Anytime you're in the New Testament looking at something in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, these are called... They're called the synoptic gospels. That's because they have a synonymous view of everything that's mentioned in, you may have something mentioned in Luke and Matthew, not in Mark. You may have something in Mark and Luke, but not in Matthew. And it gives you, each one of them, it gives you their view of this happening. Um, Matthew was an apostle. Luke was a Gentile. Mark was a follower of Paul and Barnabas. But he was not a he was not a, an apostle. The only there's two apostles of the four gospels, Matthew and John. But these are the synoptic gospels. So, let's look here in Luke, the 11th chapter. How are demons cast out? What he tells us here in verse 19, 
The Pharisees have said, you, you cast out devils by Beelzebub. He said, if Satan cast out Satan, oh yes, that's another word that people are all confused on Satan. When they hear me say there's no such thing as demons, demonion, that's man's imagination. If you think, if you believe in demons, you got to believe in Hercules. You got to believe in Hercules. Or when you look up in the McClinican Strong, you look up Hercules. It will say the Tyrian Baal. That's what it'll tell you. Baal means the Lord. But God refused to let his people call him Baal because that's what the pagans call their gods. So if you believe the Tyrian Baal means the, the Baal of Tyre. That's what Israel was involved in in the Old Testament when Ahab married Jezebel and brought her father's gods, which was just north of Israel, right up here in Tyre and Sidon. Je Ahab married Jezebel, brought her gods down into northern Israel, and they began to worship Baal, which was Hercules. Same thing. And his birthday was December the 25th. That would take me into Christmas, and I don't have time to go there. It, the birthday of the unconquerable sun was December the 25th. That was the longest nights of the year. Now let's read this here. And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. But if I with the finger of God, there's some things you have to notice here. Finger of God, cast out devils. He says, my finger cast out devils. What does God do with his finger? That's the whole point. If I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is coming to you. If I have with the finger of God, then whatever he does with his finger brings the kingdom of God unto you. Where is the kingdom of God? Now, should I say, what is the kingdom of God? There in Luke, the 17th chapter, the Pharisees asked Jesus in verse 20, are you going to restore the kingdom of God at this time? And Jesus said, the kingdom of God is in you, wherever the king is. If you have the king in you and you've been born again, the king in you is the kingdom of God. Why is that? Well, the 13th chapter of Hosea tells you that the Lord said to Israel, you desire a king among you when when you didn't want Samuel's sons to be to follow him into the priest's office or into the prophet's office. So he said, You demanded a king and I gave you a king. I gave you a king, Saul, but God says that's the wrong king because the true king of Israel, they were insisting they wanted a king. Saul come out of the tribe of Benjamin. And the true king has to come out of Judah. Benjamin is the 12th son of Jacob, or Israel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel in Genesis, the 32nd chapter. So all of the 12 sons of Jacob are Israel. His name was changed to Israel. So the true king has to come out of Judah, and the first king out of Judah was David. He followed Saul into the kingship. I'm not going to spend any time on that. i got too many places to go. All right. So if I with the finger of God cast out devils, the kingdom of God or Israel is coming to you. And 
They said, are you going to restore the kingdom? He said, the kingdom is in you. If you're a believer, it's in you. The kingdom of God, I hear these preachers say, well, God's going to usher in his kingdom very shortly. It's here. It's us. I don't know what people do with those verses. Jesus said, the kingdom cometh not with observation. There in Luke 20, 21, uh, 17, 20, and 21. He said, it didn't come with observation. That means ocular observance. It means something you see. It's not going to come with David riding across some uh, drawbridge that goes into a, a wall around Jerusalem and bringing out his armies with a shield. It's not going to come that way. The kingdom of God is in you. Jesus said, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. I don't believe in fighting anyone. What about America? Do you believe we ought to be over there fighting? Not the church. Paul said, what have I to do to judge with those who are outside the church? I feel sorry for the soldiers over there. They're fighting a never-ending war. I, I have an allegiance to them, but not to the cause they're there. Nothing's going to change, and there's distress of nations with perplexity, aporia, no answer, no way out. Do I think we ought to be over there? We are a Babylonian system. We are let us make us a name system. So when we're over there bombing, uh, bombing Baghdad, it's just... Babylon bombing her mother. That's all it is. That's what they are. That's our mother over there. Now, he said, if I were the finger of God, cast out devils. Well, what does he do with his finger? That's the point. Well, when you look over here, and you've got to connect Matthew 12 with this. Matthew 12. Look there. Because he gives you the same incident the same incident in Matthew, the 12th chapter. The apostles say you're casting out devils by Beelzebub, another name for Satan in the ancient world. And if you're in Matthew 12, this Matthew's account of this, here's the way he puts it. Matthew 12. All right. <clears throat> he says here in Matthew, the 12th chapter, in verse 28, they had accused him of casting out devils by Beelzebub. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, oh, so the Spirit of God has to be what God puts in our heart with his finger, Right? Spirit. And what is the Holy Spirit? Truth. Truth. John 14, 15, 16, John 15, 26, John 16, 13, and 1 John 5 and 6. These verses will tell you that the Holy Spirit will come or the Comforter, it will say the Comforter the Comforter even the Spirit of Truth. So it calls the Comforter which is the Holy Spirit Comforter is the word P-A-R-A K-L-E-T-O-S. Parakletos. We get the word comfort. P-A-R-A. K-A-L-E-O. Kaleo is the word call. Para is our word parallel. It means to call near. And we are comforted by the comforter or by the truth, by the spirit, which is truth. And 1 John 5 and 7 says, 
This is knocks it out of the ballpark. The spirit is truth. But the question is, what is the truth? I put this on the board nearly every time I get up here. The Bible says the Spirit is truth. Truth is the word A-L-E-T-H-E-I-A. -E -E Aletheia is the word truth. It is, comes from the word lanthano. Most of y'all ought to be able to tell me this. Lanthano, which means to hide, to cover up, or lie hid, conceal. Placing the alpha in front of a word negates the word. To negate means to give an opposite meaning. It negates the word and gives an opposite meaning of lanthano. When you translate alanthano, it is the word truth. It means not to hide anything. That's what it means. So, what God does, he writes truth upon our hearts. Let's read the rest of this. If I, would the, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, the Spirit is the truth. What does he do with his finger? He writes upon fleshy tables of our hearts. That's how demons are cast out. That's how self is cast out. So he says, if I were the finger of God, cast out devils, or if I were the Spirit of God, since it's with the Spirit, and that's the truth, that's when he writes upon our hearts, self goes out. Self is the demon. It's, Jesus said that the demon was self. He runs across a man in Mark, the first chapter, in the temple, and the man has an unclean spirit. This man has a, an unclean spirit. Unclean. A catharos. A catharos is the word unclean. It comes from catharos. which is the word clean or pure and the alpha privative. Boy, those alpha privatives come in handy. It means no cleanness. There's an unclean spirit. We find out that is self because this is Mark's version. Mark the first chapter of Luke's version and Luke the fourth chapter. Now here's what Luke says. Luke says he came into the temple and he found a man with an unclean daemonion. D-A-I-M-O-N-I-O-N. -I -I Remember distributing fortunes. Well, this man in Luke 4 that has the unclean demon and the man in Mark 1 has the unclean spirit, spirit, whatever it is, is going to be the same, isn't it? Because this is the same man, the same man, and the same event. So if it's the same man, whatever Jesus rebukes, and Mark, the first chapter, is going to be the unclean demon, isn't it? Is that pretty reasonable? Well, the man said, what have we to do with you? He uses plural. And they said in the first century, all their demons, this is them saying this. Not Jesus saying this, not the Bible. They said their demons came in hordes. They were just many of them. And they said that these demons were feminine gender. Feminine. Well, Jesus turns around, looks at the man, 
And Bible says Jesus rebuked him. A U T O masculine gender singular. When Jesus is talking to one of these wacky people, he don't believe what they're saying to him. You can't believe that. So if he rebuked him, he's rebuking the unclean spirit in Mark 1 and the unclean demonion, and him is a form of A-U-T-O self. An automobile is self-mobile in the Greek. To say him, they'll either use this word auto. If they want to say her, they'll say A-U-T. Ada, that's the Ada is always feminine gender. That's this Ada right here on the end of a word is always feminine. When the Bible says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, doesn't say that in the original text. It says, gave himself for Ote, her. He died for his wife, the church, and no one else. You, the Greek text makes all the difference in the world. Let me get on with this and show you what this is talking about. How we connect this with the, with the uh, scapegoat. Now, Let's finish this in Matthew 12. And then he says, Then the kingdom of God has come to you, if I were the Spirit of God. So the finger and the Spirit of God have to be one and the same thing. God with his finger is right in the Spirit. Let me just give you a couple of things real quick. Real quick. Uh, you look over here in, in uh, 2 Corinthians. So this is where demons go out. When he writes upon fleshy tables of our heart, the Spirit of God, which is the truth. That's when self is going out. Now, look here in 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, and he tells you, verse 3, For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. That's how demons are cast out. That's how the kingdom of God comes to us. Not in tables of stone, as it was done in the Old Testament, but in fleshy tables of the heart. Look at Deuteronomy 9 very quickly. Deuteronomy, the ninth chapter, Deuteronomy 9. I wish there was an easy way to say all this. It's all going through my mind all at once. But Deuteronomy 9. But all this goes together. Hold on. All right. Deuteronomy 9 and verse 10. And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God. There it is again. And on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spake with you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And you can also find that God wrote with his finger on tables of stone in Exodus, the 24th chapter and the 12th verse, and in Exodus 31 and 18. Exodus 24, 12 and 31, 18. Exodus 24, 12, 31, 18. You got the finger of God writing on tables of stone. Well, he's written on fleshy tables of our hearts now. Well, you got to connect this with several other verses over in Hebrews. 
And this is talking about the church. It's not talking about a literal Israel. We are spiritual Israel. We're heavenly Jerusalem, the church of the firstborn. Then you've got over here in Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8 and verse 10. And this is the covenant that I will make with with the house of Israel, which is us. Christ is the son of his own house, whose house are we. And that was the inner sanctuary called the house of God. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts. So that's, but what does he do that? With his finger. And that's when he begins to cast out self. Now, look at the 10th chapter of Hebrews. This is the verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds will I write them. So that's the finger of God, what it's doing. In the Old Testament, and before you get away from Hebrews, the place you're going to find this uh, that I'm going to say is in the ninth chapter of Hebrews. All right. Every time you find, nearly the majority of the time you find Satan in the Old Testament, it's the word Satan. Spell Satan, but it's pronounced Satan. It means an adversary. The Bible says that David was the adversary, and the word is Satan. He was the Satan of the Philistines. Nothing wrong with the word Satan. It just means an enemy. So if we're the enemy of this world, we're the friend of God. We're the adversary of this world. Now, let's go back over to Luke. Well, there's one other thing here. When you look at the ninth chapter of Hebrews, it will tell you that... Uh, in verse 3, after the second veil, the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, it's talking about in the tabernacle or in the temple. The law was written on tables of stone kept inside the Ark of the Covenant behind this veil this area back here called the Holy of Holies was called the house of God. That was where God came down, set up on the Ark of the Covenant, and the law was written on tables of stone. It was kept inside the Ark. Where do you get that? Out of this ninth chapter. Look at this. After the second veil, after this veil right here, that's the second veil, the other veil closed off the temple to everybody except the Levites. After the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all or the holy of holies, which had the golden censer, the censer was placed here, but the high priest would come in and have the censer would take uh, this this incense from this golden altar taken in and put it between the cherubim and smoke up the inner sanctuary and the priest couldn't look up at the he couldn't look up and see God if he did God strike him dead then he says which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant the ark was here and overlaid round about with gold wherein was the golden pot of manna and they had the manna in here I don't know where they had it but they had a golden pot of manna to commemorate their what they ate in the wilderness and Aaron's rod that budded Aaron's rod God said bring me 
12 rods, one for every tribe of Israel. Instead of bringing a rod for Levi, bring me a rod. It's just a stick. Bring me one for Aaron, the high priest. And we're going to place them all in a row. Whichever one comes to life after they're dead, a dead stick, the one that buds is going to be my leader when it comes to sacrifice in the temple. And it was Aaron's rod that resurrected from the dead. And that's anytime you see Aaron's rod that budded, that's what it's talking about. And the tables of the covenant where God wrote the law on tables of stone, they kept it inside the Ark of the Covenant. Now, let's go back over here to Luke, the 11th chapter. Everything over here is equal to everything over here. If you ever study the Bible in that fashion, now go to, go to Luke 11, and people, they're not able to see what this is talking about because they haven't studied the Old Testament. Now, Luke 11. And we're going to continue where we were reading. We're going to continue where we were reading. And he says, If I with the finger of God cast out devils, that's verse 20, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, it's talking about self. When a strong man armed keeps his palace, he's going to talk about driving out the strong man. The word strong is his kuras, means a boisterous, valiant, forcible man, the one who was, wants to distribute fortunes because he's talking about casting out devils. His goods are in peace. He keeps, a man keeps his goods in peace as long as he can. He wants to hold on to all that he's made. But when a stronger than he, this is talking about the inner man and the outer man. The only one a stronger than he that comes along is going to be the inner man that's birthed in us, the inner man. You got an inner man, which is Christ in you. If when you're born again, you have an outer man. And Paul says, who will deliver me from this outer man, this flesh? He said, well, this is in Romans 7. He says, with the outer man, I serve the law of the flesh. With the inner man, I serve the law of God. And there's a battle. That's Christ in you, the inner man. And when he begins to drive out self, that's a lifetime of work on us. He's going to drive self out. He's going to put us through trials and persecution. He's going to put us through fire. He's going to make life difficult for us. When people say it's easy to be saved, it is not. Peter said, if the righteous scarcely be saved, scarce is the word mogus. It comes from the word molis. It means with, great. This is in 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, next to the last verse. With great difficulty. We're going to be saved through tribulation. We must through much tribulation. If you're not going through tribulation for what you believe, something's lacking in your life. You're either young or too young in the faith, and you got a lot of growing to do, or you don't belong to God. One of the two. But if you belong to God, He's going to cause you to be bold and to be uh, mature and to grow up and to take a stand for Christ, that's a necessity in the life of all believers. Now, let's read on into this. 
It's talking about the kingdom of God coming into us. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him, when the stronger man, which is Christ, comes in you, the inner man, he taketh from him all of his armor, all of your protection, your cars, your houses, your stuff, your things. He'll put you on your deathbed like he did me, and I thought I was dying in my mid-40s a couple of times. And he'll make you say, I give up, I surrender. You do what you want to me. And a stronger, from, he'll take from him his armor, his protection, wherein he trusted and divided his spoils. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. When the unclean spirit, the demon, the demonion, self, we've already established that the unclean spirit, according to Mark 1 and Luke 4, is self. It's the A-U-T-O, masculine gender singular. It's just the man. Our problem is us. It's nothing but us. My problem is me. Your problem is you. Don't put the blame on somebody else. Don't say, are you listening to him? <laughs> it's for you. It's for me. When the unclean spirit or self is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places. This is what the scapegoat that was cast out of Israel, he was driven into the desert where there was no water. Seeking rest and findeth none, he saith, I will return unto my house which I came out of. This is a man that's not growing like the book of Hebrews tells us there when it says in Hebrews the sixth chapter, if a man doesn't go on unto perfection, unto teleos or teleates, if he doesn't go on to maturity, growing up, perfection, it don't mean to be perfect without sin, he ends up going back to his sin and putting and he's tasted the good word of, of God and made a partaker of the heavenly gift and he goes back to his sin because he hasn't left the basic principles and gone on to understanding the Bible. A lot of things that I teach may be boring to you, but if you learn it, it'll make you strong. And when he cometh if you go back to your sin, it's impossible to re be renewed to repentance. The key word is renew. You can repent after you go back to your sin, but you can't have it brand new like it was originally. And when he cometh, he finds it swept and garnished. It's looking at your body, and it's all cleaned up from when you started believing Christ but you haven't grown. Then come, goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. This is very puzzling to a lot of people. This is Christ coming into our lives, driving us self. And if we don't have in-depth teaching and you don't go leave the basic principles uh, and go on unto perfection, to maturity, you'll end up putting Christ to an open shame. And that's possible only for believers. Now, I want us to look at the Old Testament picture of this, which is the scapegoat over here in, in Leviticus, the 16th chapter. Leviticus 16. All right. This is a picture of the scapegoat. You've got two goats here in Leviticus 16. You've got one that's going to be offered, 
And without understanding Leviticus 16, you can understand that strong man and the stronger man of Luke 11. Leviticus 16. This is the only chapter in the Bible that gives you a thorough outline of the Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement. I mean, on this day they took two goats. When the Bible says God hath made him to be sin for us, God hath made Jesus to be a goat in our place. You've got two goats here. You have on Passover you had a lamb offered. Passover. You had a lamb offered without blemish. Christ is that lamb. Fifty days after the Passover, you had the feast of first fruits. Which was which was Pentecost. And then in the tenth day of the seventh month, this is September, October. You had a, you had a, on the 10th day, 10th day, you had the Day of Atonement. That is fully described that's fully described in this Leviticus, the 16th chapter. You don't have it described like this anywhere else. The word scapegoat is mentioned four times. Four times in this chapter. And the word scapegoat is not scapegoat. It is the word Azazel. That is an ancient title for Satan. And you got it four times in this chapter. Now let's look at this this is talking about the stronger man driving out the strong man. It's talking about self being eliminated in our lives. Self dies hard. <laughs> Don't die easy. If you say, Jim, I just can't do what you do. Well, I'm 80 and you're not 80 yet. That's why. If you're 40, I know you can't. If you're 50, you're not there yet. It takes a long time to get to where when you were my age, I know that don't come up to me after church and say, you could live another 25 or 30 years. I don't believe that. <laughs> you don't understand. I want to go be with Jesus. My body's tired. It's wore out. Don't you understand that? You get it? I, I want to go be with the Lord. My body is breaking down. I've had two heart attacks. Had triple bypass surgery in 2002. I had a minor heart attack in March the 2nd of this year. I've had cancer surgery. I've had cataracts on both eyes in 1987 replaced. I've had hemorrhoid surgery, and that's the best surgery I ever had. <laughs> hurting. Oh, gosh, it hurt. I thought, this is wonderful. <laughs> when you have those things removed, it was like eggs sticking out my bottom end. <laughs> it hurts. And I was just so happy. I've had every kind of surgery you can think of. My body's tired. It's getting weary. I don't want to fight nobody. If, if I'm not going to live another 10 years, and I'll do good to live 10 years. And don't tell me, you're going to live 30 years. You think I want to be 110 years old? You're wrong. <laughs> Falling apart? Nope. Now, I want us to read this about the, this has to do 
with the strong man and the stronger man. There's, there's two goats here. Two goats. And one of them, the high priest, this is, you've heard me say this, and it says it in the ninth chapter of Hebrews, the high priest goes in once a year into the Holy of Holies. You couldn't go in. I saw the stupidest movie it was on TV yesterday. Dumb. David and Bathsheba. And Gregory Peck was playing David. David was ruddy-faced and the run of the family. He didn't look like Gregory Peck. <laughs> I thought, good grief. And they had Re Gregory Peck's being r reprimanded by Nathan the prophet. And it, But he was actually saying, we got to kill Bathsheba. That didn't happen in the Bible. Well, that was the that was the way the culture was, and that was what the Bible says if a woman commits adultery. But that was David's idea, and David said, "I alone have sinned." Well, they got David, the dumbest, stupidest thing I've ever seen. David is of the tribe of Judah. If you were not of the tribe of Levi. You couldn't be found anywhere inside the temple precincts. God would kill you. Yeah, only a high priest, only a high priest could go inside the Holy of Holies. Inside, you had inside the temple, you had the the outer sanctuary. Only Levites could come in there. Levites, and you had the altar of incense, and you had the table of showbread, we being many of one bread and one body. You had the seven candlesticks, which is a picture of the church in Revelation 1 and 20, and you had the veil here. And once a year, the, the goat would be offered would be offered on this altar and then the blood of that goat would be brought in here by the high priest only on the 10th day of the 7th month and only he could come in here. Anybody else came in there that wasn't a high priest, you would be struck dead immediately. In that dumb movie yesterday, they had David of the tribe of Judah coming over here to the temple <laughs> going in there, going into the Holy of Holies and praying to God and reaching out and touching the Ark of the Covenant. I thought, who, what idiot wrote this movie? When Uzzah touched the Ark of the Covenant and he was a priest of God, no one was supposed to be touching the Ark. It was carried on by poles and it had rings. And I've gone through this. It had poles and it was carried by the sons of Korah, which they were Levites, but they weren't high priests. And they had David reaching out and touching that ark. He had fallen dead immediately. That's it. Whoever wrote that movie needs to have their head examined. I'm picking apart movies all the time. I was sitting there just disgusted, thinking, you dumbbell. Whoever wrote this, you ought to have rocks thrown at you or something. Ought to be stoned. Now, the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before the Lord and died, that was Nadab and Abihu. And the Lord said unto Moses, speaking to Aaron, thy brother, that he come not at all into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark that he die not, and I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. God would appear on that mercy seat, but he had to offer incense in there and cloud that place up because if he said, if the high priest said, I think I'll sneak a peek at God, he would fall dead immediately. Could not look up at the mercy seat. That's where the Lord would come down out of heaven 
and sit down on the mercy seat. And that, and the mercy seat was on the top of the ark. And the mercy seat was, that was the throne of God. So anytime you find the throne in, make this realization, this evaluation. He sat upon the mercy seat, the throne. Inside the throne was the, was the law written on tables of stone. Inside our hearts is the law written on fleshy tables of the heart. The heart was the place of understanding to the Jewish mind. So our hearts are the mercy seat. So therefore, if this is equal to this, then he sits upon the throne of our heart. He, does, he said, I will not abide with a harlot. If you've got Babylon in you and you've got the devil or the demon and all you want to do is make money and have your fame and have your fortune, God has to bring you to a place where you say, Lord, whatever you want in my life. There has to be death to self. That's when he writes upon facing tables of our hearts. He said in Romans, the fifth chapter, Romans 5, that he is shed abroad He's shed abroad his love in our hearts. That word love is agape. And agape is walking in the commandments of God. Well, wait a minute. That's the same thing. Shed abroad his love at K-O-E-K-C-H-E-O -E -E <coughs> means to gush out. He has gushed out his commandments. You have the word agape and phileo. Phileo means to have affection for. Agape was the relationship that kings had for their subjects. He gave them laws and they willingly walked in them. Well, he wrote his law on tables of stone and he's written it on fleshy tables of our heart and that's how demons are cast out. Self is cast out. Boy, they have got this wild imagination going on across America that there's demons out here. They ain't no demons. The demon is you. How's that? You. Me. That's the demon self. If we can get over ourselves, we can get over our problems. Right? If you don't worry about what people are stealing from you, beating you out of, whether somebody else is going to get attention you think belongs to you, you are exactly where God wants you. He works all things after the counsel of his own will. He's got you where he wants you. He's declared the end from the beginning, from ancient times, everything that's not yet done. If we can get rid of you and me. But I'll tell you what, it'll help you. I'll tell you what will help you get over self. Get old. <laughs> If you can learn to be 65 or 70, uh, I don't think you can learn that. It takes years to learn that, and you quit wanting to fight for your rights. Let me read something to you. I hadn't read to you in a long time. This comes out of commentary from the New Testament uh, from the Talmud and Hebraica. This is by Mr. Lightfoot. It's out of Luke the eighth chapter and it's talking about the woman out of whom went seven devils. Let me read this to you. Mr. Lightfoot, that's the best set of commentaries I have ever run across. Whenever I've got questions, I'll go to Lightfoot's commentaries. He took his whole life researching, but he couldn't get everything in the Bible. Once in a while I look and I say, oh goodness, he didn't he didn't come up with that. But let me tell you what he said devils were, or demons. Out of whom went seven devils. This is a woman out of whom went seven devils. Why seven? Remember, seven is the word Sheba in the Hebrew. That's the word seven. It is a form of Shabua, S-H-E-B-U. A H. Shabuah means to take an oath to God or to seven oneself. 
if you're sevened, that's when you go through the seven things in Second Peter 1 and 5. Besides all this, give all diligence, add to your faith. You can't, and then he names seven things, and he starts with virtue, goes to knowledge. How long does it take you to learn all these things? I know you probably won't learn what I've learned because I've spent all these years. I've spent unbelievable amount of hours studying. But you will learn what God wants you to learn. He'll give you enough to make you strong. Let me read this to you. Our difficulty is whether these words are to be taken according to their letter, in other words, exactly what they say, or according to the Jewish sense. I think we're going to go with the Jewish sense, okay? Who will want to call vices by the name of devils. America does that. You read about some Hollywood star uh, talking about uh, Robert, that actor that got into so many drugs for years, said he's getting hold of his demons. They said that on the TV. Robert uh, something. He's a famous actor anyway. And they call devils by an evil affection is Satan. They call an evil affection Satan. Drunkenness by the new wine is devils. If this Mary be the same with the woman that was a sinner in the foregoing chapter in Luke 7, the one that had her feet washed with tears, as it is believed, then by devil seems to be understood the vices to which she was addicted. That was, uh, let me put it this way, the sins to which she was addicted. Especially when both the Pharisee and the evangelist called her a sinner rather than a demoniac. She was called a sinner. So when you're a sinner, you got devils in you. And God is working on that outer man saying, you got to do what the inner man says. How long does it take self to go out? Your lifetime? Don't think you've arrived because you got saved one time. Yeah, but let's get back to the 16th chapter. Thus, verse 3, Thus Aaron came into the holy place with a young bullet, for a sin offering that was for him to cleanse him before he, and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat, and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and shall be girded with a linen girdle, with linen mitre shall he be attired. These are the holy garments. What are our holy garments? The blood of Christ. He's washed us from our sins in his own blood. He's made our robes white in the blood. These were white garments. He washed his flesh in water and put them on. He shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats. He's going to do something different with each one of them. For a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of sin offering, that's for himself, to cleanse him before he goes to offer this goat, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself, for his house. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats. One of them is going to be the scapegoat, and the other's going to be the one that dies, a picture of Christ. One that dies and his blood is sprinkled is a picture of Christ. The scapegoat is going to be driven out of Israel, and that's the picture. He's going to be driven into a desert where there is no water. There is no living water. The way Luke 11 puts it, he's driven into a dry place. If it's dry, there's no water there. 
and the scapegoat was driven out into the wilderness. That is a picture of our sins leaving us, God writing upon fleshy tables of our hearts. That's what this scapegoat is. This is a picture of Luke 11. When self goes out, then Christ has come in and he says, you have to learn to die every day. That's why cast out devils is casting out self. The very picture of the scapegoat here in Leviticus, the 16th chapter. That's the strong man being driven out by one that's stronger. Now let's keep reading. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, the one for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. The one's going to die and be slaughtered on this altar, and his blood is going to be taken in by the high priest. Who is the high priest that sprinkles our heart? Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Christ is a, he is Melchizedek over this temple now. I would like to go into Melchizedek. I don't have time. Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the Azazel. You find Azazel in verse 8. You find Azazel here in verse 10. You find Azazel twice in verse 10. And you find Azazel uh, down in verse 26. That's the scapegoat, the one that's driven out. They don't know exactly what happened to the scapegoat, but he was not allowed to come back because if he comes back, it'll be seven times worse. That's the picture of self is the scapegoat and the sins. Let's read on. Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering He'll kill him on this altar, bring his blood in, and sprinkle it on the Ark of the Covenant. Our hearts are sprinkled by the blood of Christ. God hath made him a goat in our place. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for scapegoat into the wilderness. For an Azazel into the wilderness, into dry places where there is no living water, which is the Word of God, which is the Holy Spirit. Jesus told the woman at the well, I'll give you living water and you'll never thirst again. Then he says, Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself, because as a priest of God, he cannot go in there unless he's clean and pure. And for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord, from this right here, that golden offering, and bring it in here, and sprinkle it in there. And his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. So he will take this this incense from the altar. What is the New Testament shadow, very image of the incense? The Bible says the New Testament image is our, is the prayers of the saints. That goes up as a sweet smelling savor to God. But you can't pray unless you're bound to the will of God. He shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. He will die if, he's, if he can see through that incense and see God up there. He's dead. And they say they would tie a rope around the high priest's leg just in case he did something wrong so they could drag his dead body out. Then they'd turn to one of the sons of Aaron and say, which one of you guys want to be next? I wouldn't want to be a high priest in Israel. If you, you may not remember, but, but Sanballat, the enemies of God, the enemy of God, 
tried to get Nehemiah to come into the temple and meet him in there. And it's believed that Nehemiah was, was a eunuch. Nehemiah said, I'm not going in there. You're out of your mind. And he took of the blood of the bullock and sprinkled it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. Seven is the number of refinement. He shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is with the people and bring his blood inside the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat upon our hearts. Our hearts are sprinkled with the blood. We're elected. A blood baptism was a death. 1 Peter 1 and 2 says we're elected unto obedience and the sprinkling of blood. A blood sprinkling was a death and it's not dipping somebody into anything. Before the mercy seat and he shall make an atonement for the whole place, so forth. Let me get on down here. I'm not going to be able to finish it if I don't. In verse 19, he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with the with his finger seven times. He's with the finger, with the finger of the high priest, he's going to sprinkle the blood seven times upon the mercy seat. And cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. When he hath made an end of reconciling, that word reconciling is a very interesting word, kafar. Kafar is the same word as atonement. This is the day of atonement, the tenth day of the seventh month. And when our hearts are sprinkled is the day of atonement in our life. When you begin to believe and the truth enters your heart, and that's not something you do, that's something God does in you, that's predestination. Reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation, the altar, he shall bring the live goat. They've sacrificed, that's Christ. The live goat was sacrificed, slain upon the altar, brought in by the priest, same thing as sprinkling our hearts in Hebrews 10, 22. And Aaron shall lay his hands upon the head of the live goat. He's going to impart the sins of the people figuratively on the head of the live goat and driving out into dry places, into a wilderness where there is no water. And confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel. This is a picture of driving out the strong man by the stronger man. And all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man, a timely man, one that's been chosen to take him into the wilderness. Some say they would have stations for the live goat. They would take him out in the wilderness and then another man would take him further and then further. They don't know exactly what happened to him, but they know they did not permit him to come back in. That sin coming back into your life. A fit man into the wilderness and the goat shall bear upon him all the iniquities of the people. When... Christ died. He died bearing our iniquities. He's driving out self. He's birthed himself into us by his will. And how long does it take him to drive self out? The inner man is perfect. He can't sin. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. What part of you is born of God? The inner man. Christ in you, the hope of glory. What part of you is not born of God is the outer man that serves the law of the flesh. It's self. Does anybody have a problem with self? Having your way, getting mad. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. She raised up both heads. <laughs> if you, and, and the rest of you ought to be ashamed of yourself for lying. <laughs> 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 
we've all had problems with self. The younger you are, the more problems you have with you. And then he says, And the goat shall bear upon him all the iniquities of the land not inhabited, and he shall, if it's land not inhabited, it's a wilderness where there is no water. It's dry places, like Luke the 11th chapter says. And he shall let the goat, he shall let go the goat in the wilderness, and it's not allowed to come back. The sins are upon it. That's the outer man that's driven, driven out all of your life. Whosoever is born of God, the inner man, doth not commit sin. His seed remains in him, and he cannot sin, 1 John 3 and 9. But 1 John 1 and 1 says, says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. The younger you are, the more self you got in you, and the more demon you got, and the more that has to be driven out. The older you get, you don't, as a believer, the longer you've been through fire and trials, the less of self you want. It, isn't that right? And Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation, shall put off the linen garments. This is the day of atonement, the tenth day of the seventh month that we've talked about so much. And Christ is a picture of the goat that's offered on the altar and sprinkled upon the, the blood upon the Ark of the Covenant, and the scapegoat is a picture of us and our sins. And shall leave them there. And in verse 26, and he that let go the goat for the scapegoat shall wash his hands, bathe his flesh in water, and afterwards come into the camp. Let me give you two more verses. Verse 29. And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day, how many times have I said that? 5,000? The tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. And on that day you shall afflict your souls. Oh, no. That's the only fast that was ordained by God in Israel was on the day of atonement. On the day, on the day of atonement was the driving out of self. And then when he says, for on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you and you shall be clean all of your sins before the Lord and it shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you and ye shall afflict your souls. That's the word. It's the same word as fast in the 58th chapter of Isaiah. When people say, should I fast? Well, if you fast for health, that's good. But if you fast to be spiritual, that's not going to help you. There's a fast. And to show you what it is, go to the 58th chapter of Isaiah. There's a fast of giving up self. That's the day of atonement when they drove the scapegoat out. Azazel. Oh, just another name for Satan. Satan has to be driven out of our lives over our lifetime. We don't sin with the inner man, but the outer man can't stop himself. So God has to put you through fire and trials and persecution and everything you can imagine to get your attention. Look here in Isaiah 58. You want to know what the fast is? It's afflicting the soul when God is driving out self. Here it is right here. 58 chapter of Isaiah. Fifty-eight. Let's start down here in verse 3. Wherefore have we fasted say they, says Israel, and thou seest not, wherefore have we afflicted our soul? Ani, which is a form of anah. 
That's a form of the word on the Day of Atonement. He's going to tell you what the Day of Atonement is like, the day of getting rid of self, the day of getting rid, and it's every day for the rest of our life. If you learn to recognize the fire, and thou takest no knowledge, behold, in the day of your fast you find pleasure and exact all your labors. You don't stop working in the day of the fast. It's not talking about a literal fast and a literal Sabbath. It's talking about a spiritual Sabbath resting in the things of God. Behold, you fast for strife. Strife is the word reap. You, you say, I'm fasting more than you. Reeb. It comes to the word rube. It means to fight. If you're a circus performer or you're out at the fair and you start arguing with one of those guys and they cry, rube. That means everybody's going to come running and they're going to defend that guy and his ball throwing or whatever it is he's got. You fast for strife and debate. Debate, matseh, M-A-T-S-T-S-A-H, means quarrel or contention. You, stri you fast, you give up food just to brag about what you're doing. Anybody says, we've been fasting for so-and-so. How much time do I have left? Oh, gosh, it's 23 hours left. That's not fasting. That's putting on a show. To smite with the fist of wickedness, you shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen, God says? I'm not talking about giving up food. What's funny is people, for their Lent, some Catholic will, I'm giving up Brussels sprouts. I hate Brussels sprouts. Giving up something you hate is not fasting. <laughs> Giving up self is fasting. He goes on to say that. A day for a man to afflict his soul. Same word as the fast on the day of atonement, the day of God sprinkling our hearts. Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast, an acceptable day of the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? Here's my fast to afflict the soul, to loose the bands of wickedness in your life, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke that burdens people down. Is not, it is not to deal thy bread to the hungry, to reach out to the widows and the orphans that can't help themselves and give up self? Isn't that the true fast? That thou bring the poor that are cast out to your house? Here's your fast. Sacrifice your time and your place in your home. When thou seest the naked Thou shalt cover him. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. James 1 and 27. To visit the fatherless, the orphanos. We get our word orphan from that. It's the same word in John 14. I will send the comforter. And I will not leave you comfortless. And what is the comforter? It's the Holy Spirit. It's truth. Comfortless is the same word, orphanos. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you in the form of the Holy Spirit. Wait a minute. That's what we said earlier. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is what casts out self, isn't it? With the finger of God. Notice how these things just click together. <clears throat> Where was I? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, giving up self? 
that thou bring the poor that are cast out of thy house, when thou seest the naked that thou cover him. What do we cover him with? Well, clothes if he needs it, if you see your brother have need, and you shut up your bowels of compassion from him, give him not what's not need for the body. How does the love of God dwell in you? It doesn't. If you're just selfish into self, and it's just me and mine and my money and myself and what I want, then you have got the devil in you. you got the demon in you. And thou, that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh, then shall thy light break forth as the morning. This is the true fast, afflicting the soul, giving himself. Afflict the soul is the same basic word as afflict the soul in Leviticus, the 16th chapter, giving up self. And thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee when you have this fast. The glory of the Lord shall be thy re-reward. A re-reward means he brings up the rear and he's a vanguard in front of you. He's leading you and he's bringing up the rear. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. When there's death to self, you're bound to the will of God, and that's the meaning of the word prayer, isn't it? How much time do I have, Mike? If thou take away from the midst of the, thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity, if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, that's giving up self. That's when demons go out of our life. And thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noonday. Everything brightens up in your life. Let me tell you, it took me a long time to learn this. When I was in real estate selling and making a lot of money, I said, this is my money and I'm not sharing it with nobody. God had to get me old and teach me these verses to make me free-hearted. I... Well, I'm going to give up self. That's what I believe in. Whatever it costs to help the downtrodden and the needy, getting this message out to the world out here, it takes a lot just to pay the light bill, pay the rent, send out about $2,500 a month in tapes and DVDs, giving the poor money, it's, it's death to self is what it is, and it's death to this, death to this outer man. That outer man don't die real easy. He don't want to just give up. Sometimes God has to put you in a hospital a dozen times like he's done me. Finally, about that final time, I just said, Lord, I give up, I surrender. If I don't stop doing what I'm doing, you're going to kill me. I had to come to a place. I don't care. I will say anything to anybody any day of the week, anywhere, anytime. And I use wisdom. I don't jump people's cases. I just say things to them about the Lord or God or Jesus. I wasn't that bold when I was young. It took a long time to get there. It takes a lot of fire a lot of tribulation, to wear out this outer man. I was going to go into the inner and outer man. You can look at those, at that seventh chapter of Romans. You can look at the fourth chapter of Ephesians, putting on the inner man. You can look at the fourth chapter of Second Corinthians. You can look at Colossians, the third chapter. Look at everything it says to put off in order to put on this inner man. It's death to self is what it is. I preach this more than I preach anything else. I'm not preaching to vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. I'm not looking for them. We're looking for God's elect, but I want to teach the elect how to live, 
How do you know how to live? I've learned how. I've learned how not to live. I've learned how to live. There's so much more to this story, but I hope you can see this about the scapegoat is that strong man being driven out of the camp, out into a dry place where there's no water, and he's not allowed to come back because if he comes back, it's going to be seven times worse. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your truth. Help us to continue this work. Help people to hear and listen. Help them realize their demon is, the only demon they have is themselves. Lord, that's a hard thing to get rid of because we just don't want to get rid of it. Thank you for all the trials you put us through and the persecution and the tribulation that will make us willing to give up this flesh. We'll give you praise for everything in Christ's name. Amen. Beans. <laughs> beans. I had, I had the huge surgery. ones. Yeah. Well, that's the best surgery I ever had. I have this uh, Bible homework. Huh? I, I have Bible homework, and I don't understand that question. I couldn't find it in my dad's Bible. How did God see everything that he made? Well, there's a bunch of verses. Uh, Ecclesiastes 3.14. What's God to do with it? He does forever. Uh, well, you can put Ecclesiastes 3.14 down there, and you can put uh, Isaiah 46 and 10. That's how he knows, because he does it. He, he planned the end from the beginning. From ancient times, everything is not yet done. You wanted a verse on there? Yeah, my uh, was doing this and he wanted the verse. Huh? He wanted the verse on there. Well, I, yeah, Ecclesiastes 3.14. Can I write with this? Yes. Okay. 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 Six and ten. Is that all you need? Just a couple of verses? Okay, there you go. Okay. Hi, brother. Hi, I may, you may not see me for a couple of weeks. I told Mary I'm detoxing from Klonopin. I'm getting rid of that awful, obnoxious stuff. I've had to take it since 2009. And thank the Lord, I don't have Alzheimer's. It is a throwaway right into Alzheimer's. So uh, they've got a new drug that come out because of my ADHD and stuff. Okay. So I just want you to know what I'm happening. We're old. You just you know, what, here. Can, what I can, I don't know. <laughs> don't let me catch up. I won't. <laughs> I love you so much. Uh, I'm so really, I'm not just avoiding it. My, uh, I'm just my wife out. is up helping her mother-in-law come down here. So I put that in here. Do you want this? Or well, you can give it to me. That's, I just put it my, in here. That's my loot for the month. What are you doing? You want some gum? Hold I love on. You. See you later. I love you too. I don't know. I might come in here, but I'm going to have fangs and stuff. Okay. Here you go. Hey. There you go.
Yo sin jam. Alright, hold on. Here you go. You're gonna take some to your sisters. Here, take them some and take your brother some. That ought to be enough. Sorry, I wasn't able to be there. I'm just, I'm not feeling good at all. I wasn't feeling good during this message. Well, you look like you picked up. This time went on. I guess. I can't hear you. They've all been sick, she said. Well, I'm not going to come too close. Okay. I'm not feeling. I'm not feeling good at all. I don't know how I got through the message. No, I'll be all right. I'm just weak. I'm extremely weak. I'm just struggling. Good to see you, bro. For this day, to meet you in person before the Lord takes you home. And well, I'm so glad he blessed me. Oh, good to see you here. I'm so glad. This We're is, glad y'all come. Yeah. Well, you know what? He you just met made Scott, it possible. Didn't you? Yeah, yeah. He didn't know we were showing up because this was kind he of a last minute us. thing. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Jim. What are you doing, brother? How are you doing? Doing okay. Are you painting a lot? Yeah. Good. Yeah. I'm not doing too well. I'm struggling. I, I really didn't mean to make it today. Really? I'm just I'm something on it. Yeah. I don't know if it's age or if it's something in the air, if it's a virus or what. 